Genesis 24. A bride for Rebecca. A bride for Rebecca. You remember last Sunday? Nobody remembers last Sunday. Everybody is silent. Does anybody remember last Sunday? Yes. Eliezer is on the... Who is Eliezer? His name is mentioned only once in the book of Genesis. The chief servant of the household of Abraham. And he is in charge of everything in Abraham's household. And how old is Isaac now? He is 40. Okay? He's not yet 40, he's going to be 40. When he got married, he was 40 years. We do not know how long it took for Rebekah to reach Isaac's home because it was a long, long journey, over 500 miles. It's a long journey. Those days, long journey. But when she, he got married, he was 40 years. And 40 signifies 50 jubilees, which is 2000. Years. The wedding of the Lamb is getting closer and closer. The Spirit of God is searching and preparing a bride for His Son. Never forget the purpose. The purpose, the Spirit of God is drawing us towards the Father so that we can become the bride of the Son. Not to see that we have a good life over here. Not that I am saved now. I know I am not going to hell. Now let me have a good time. Purpose. Don't forget the purpose. We forget the main purpose. The main purpose is to be the bride. Because sometimes we forget the, the purpose. That's why Genesis 24 is so important because we see in the purpose Abraham putting conditions. And he says, you cannot pick a bride from among the Canaanites. The bride will be always picked from my household. Go back to my household and pick the bride from there. Meaning from God's, there are two purposes. First, get into the Lord's household. Second, in the Lord's household, a bride is going to be chosen. From the household of the Lord, the bride is going to be chosen. And Eliezer asks this question. What if the bride is not willing to come back with me? Can I take the son there? And Abraham says, no. You do not take the son back. Please remember that. It's we who go to the father. We don't get the son back into the world. It's only when we forget the purpose. Then we start compromising. We start changing everything because we think even Sunday worship is about us. Is it about us? It's not, definitely not. It's about Him. That has to be an emphatic no. It's not about us. It's about Him. That's the whole thing. If it is about us, then the compromises become very easy. Sunday worship, the first half an hour becomes entertainment. You know why I go to this church? Because worship is very good. You know why I go to the other church after that? Because the word is very good. <laughs> and evening I go to this other church because prayer is very powerful. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's not about him. Please remember, our whole purpose of life is about him. It's about the bridegroom. It's very difficult in the 21st century to say it's all about the bridegroom. Because we are fighting for gender equality here, you see. But I'm... Fortunately, for gender equality people, our God is still patriarchal. <laughs> so when the son came, he said, you can pray, my father or mother who art in heaven. He didn't say that. He says, my father who art in heaven. I have come that you may know the father. The mother is there, very powerful there in the role of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying the gender of the Holy Spirit, but you look at the role of the Holy Spirit, powerful, functioning, doing everything, but taking no limelight. The Holy Spirit will not talk about himself, he talks about the Father and the Son. Remember that. Okay? Meaning in most houses the things are all done by the mother. Father takes the credit. Okay. But it's very difficult. You know what's the most difficult instrument to play? It's a trick question. The most difficult instrument to play is to play the second fiddle.
You didn't get it. In English, to play second fiddle means not to take the limelight. You need to realize. Okay. We need to realize. You look at the instruments that are over here. Today when we had worship, we had a piano or a keyboard. We had a guitar and we had a violin. Do you think the keyboard was tuned according to the violin? Do you think the violin was tuned to the guitar? No. If you check with them, there is a tuner. There was a tuner. Right? There is a tuner. Most of them is the tuner anywhere around here. Most of you wouldn't know. This is the tuner. All the instruments are tuned to this. Are you getting the picture? I am not tuned to him. He is not tuned to me. We are all asked to be tuned to that tuner called Jesus Christ. But the whole problem is that we are looking at other instruments and saying, I want to be like that. If they were all tuned differently and not to the tune, instead of a symphony, we will have cacophony. <laughs> and that's basically what's happening in the church, because everybody is trying to get tuned to things they see in the world without realizing, be tuned to the bridegroom. That is the standard. The standard isn't me. The standard isn't anybody here. The standard is him. And therefore, there has to be a change, a constant change. In the old days, when a girl child was born, you're not talking about a boy child, a girl child was born and she was brought up. You know, she was trained right from the beginning, all they were up for one purpose, to be a wife and to be a mother. I go back to the northeast, to those villages in Bhutan, and I will see every small little girl over there knows how to keep the house thick and span, cook. The mother sits there and supervises. Every one of them is trained to sweep, to swap, to wash, to dry, to wash the clothes, to cook, before they are in their teens. Every one of them. And you can see the three daughters, the mother will sit there and she will give instructions, do this, do this, do this, do this. By the time they are 13, 14, 15 years old, they are ready to run a household. God is preparing us to be something else. You know what? To be a bride. And everything He allows to happen in our lives is connected with that. We forget that. We forget the very purpose to which He has called us into His body. Is to what? To be the bride of His Son. To be the bride of his son. We never forget that purpose. And that's the purpose Abraham is telling Eliezer. Go to my father's household. Go to my father's. Go back to my father's household. Find a girl for my son. And Eliezer says, if, my, if, if the girl is not willing to come, what should I do? Can I take the son back there? He says, no. The girl has to come from there. The son will never go back to the world. Meaning, if our focus is on the son... We will not start changing things in our life. We will start changing things in our life to tune with the sun. Every instrument has to come and fall in line with this. The violin doesn't look at the guitar. The guitar doesn't look at the keyboard. The keyboard doesn't look at the drums. All of them look at that. And God is saying, you are all different instruments. You are not meant to be the same, but you are all supposed to be tuned into Him. That's the purpose. When we start tuning our lives to Him, we become, start becoming more and more like the bride that the Father is looking for, His Son. So Elias has started on a journey. And scripture says, everything the Father had was in His hands. Did you get it? Ten camels, full of goods, He goes. Ten is the number of divine order. What does the scripture say? Everything Abraham had was under Elias' authority and he had the permission to use it to get a bride for Isaac. Get that picture very clearly. If as individuals we are on the journey to become a bride for Christ Jesus or as ministries we are preparing a people to become the bride of Christ Jesus, there is no lack of resources even in the time of recession. 
Because everything of the Father is entrusted for that purpose. Not to just save people and leave them in the lurch, but to save people to make them into a bride. So never forget the purpose. We are on the way to becoming a bride. And there he goes with the camels. And after a long, long, long journey, we do not know how many months it took him. He comes at even time. At evening, there he is. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening. It's a time of the evening. Evening means the new day is just a few hours away. Eliezer who represents... <sighs> represents the Holy Spirit has come with all his resources and there he is at the evening time looking for the bride. Many women are going to come out now. That's the time when the women go out but among the many women, one woman is going to be picked. Before the new day breaks, the bride is going to be chosen. The new day is just, I don't know how long away. 2000 years are almost over. The choosing of the bride is going to happen very soon. And there they are waiting outside. And verse 12 says, He said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me Godspeed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. What does he do there? Eliezer is outside the town seeking guidance. Hello? Did we seek guidance last week? Did we forget okay, so today is a new day? Did we seek guidance from God today? There he is standing there. Before he will start anything, he is saying, Lord, I need guidance. Genesis 24 is very interesting. In Genesis 24, there is no dream, no dream, no vision, no prophecy, no signs, no discern, the word of knowledge, nothing. Yet the term, the word God is used 17 times. Meaning you don't need vision, you don't need dreams, you don't need prophecy, you don't need the word of knowledge. Yet, if you kneel before God, He will still lead you and His purpose will be fulfilled. 17 times the word God is used in the book of Genesis in chapter 24 because the man, the servant says, O God of my father Abraham, I need guidance. I need wisdom. Tomorrow is a new day. Before you begin tomorrow, go before the presence of God and say, Lord, I need guidance. Be very careful. Why is he seeking guidance? Because the decisions we take every day is important. Why is he seeking guidance? Because if you don't seek guidance and tune our hearts to God, we will hear what we want to hear. We will hear what we want to hear. If our hearts are not controlled by the word, if our hearts are controlled by the word, we will hear what we want to hear. But if our hearts are controlled by the word, we will hear what we should hear. Be careful. Be very careful. Check your heart. What controls my heart when God speaks? Do I hear what I want to hear? Or do I? That's a confusion that's happening in the churches. Because it's not that God isn't speaking, but people are hearing differently. Hearing differently. You know why? Because we are not tuned to this standard. We hear differently. I told you, I've asked in my classrooms, old days when I used to teach students to come out of the window, go out and look for two seconds and come back. Then ask them to come and say, what did you see? And usually if you send three students, all three would see differently. Each one saw what is according to his or her heart. That's why our hearts have to be controlled by God. That's what he said. He said, I will not make a choice. I will not make a choice. I'm surrendering a God to your sovereignty, God of my master Abraham. I want you to make the choice. I do not know. Because this is not my call, this is your call. I want you to make the choice. Otherwise what happens? We will hear what we want to hear. And what does scripture say? He prays and he puts only a simple request over there. It looks simple but it's not simple. Behold I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of men of the city come out to draw water. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher 
I pray thee that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. I want you to look at that, that last words. Kindness to whom? He says, not that you have shown kindness to me. If you look most of our prayers, our prayers are, Lord, Lord, if you answer this way, then I know you are good to me. He says, no, you are good to my master. Do we put this when we pray, Lord, when you answer my prayer, let the name of Jesus be glorified? The key. The key is, I'm not answering. He is not saying, Lord, I'm so happy, you know. I know that after all this long journey and troublesome journey, I was successful. He said, no, that my master was successful. That's what it means by Jesus said, when you pray, pray, that thy will be done. That's the key. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. And somebody comes out. Yes. Next verse. And it came to pass before he had done speaking. Why does it say before he had done speaking? Whenever you see God's will, it will be done before you finish speaking. Whenever you are seeking your will, there is a long delay. And that behold, Rebecca came out with a picture upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon. A virgin, neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well, filled a pitcher, and came up. A girl came, a young girl came out. She was very fair. Now here, of course, it's talking about physical beauty. The scripture we looked two weeks back, when we looked at Esther, we looked at when God looks for a bride for his son, what is he looking for? Whether you are a man or a woman, what is he looking for? He is looking for a quiet and a meek spirit. He is looking for what? A quiet and a meek spirit. Peter talks about that is the beauty that God is looking for. And we ask ourselves, Lord, as you are searching hearts today, what do you see in me? Don't think about what does you see in your neighbor, the one who is sitting on your left. Just ask, what is that you see in me, Lord? Do I have that meekness that you are looking for? Do I have that meekness of God? And it says she was fair. And it says that she had not known any man. What does it mean? She was not polluted by the world. She was not polluted by the world. Are we? Are we? Are our hearts divided? Are our loyalties divided? Because the only enemy we have is the world. The, who is the one who is seeking our loyalty? Who is the one seeking the loyalty as a believer from our heart? It is the world. Are our hearts divided? Are we stayed on to Christ Jesus? Or we got a secret boyfriend called the world. What does the Lord see? Because you cannot hide anything from the Spirit of God. We can hide from one another. When the Spirit of God sees, what does He see in us? 600,000 men and women and children besides, says the book of Exodus, Moses brought out of Egypt into the desert. 500,000, sorry, 5 lakh, 99,997 of them were rejected because they brought Egypt along with them. There also God was choosing a bride. He said, I am married, I am betrothed to you Israel. He was choosing a bride. But the problem was that except for three people, Moses, Caleb and Joshua, all the others were wedded to the land they were supposed to leave. They left Egypt, but Egypt was with them. Whenever they had to make a choice or a decision, a test or a problem, their reference point always was Egypt. Check their conversation through those 40 years. Every time they had to make a choice, their reference wasn't the God of Israel, it was Egypt. Egypt was like that, Egypt was like that, Egypt was like that. Egypt. What's your reference point? When you do things, why do you do things? Is it because it is written? Is it because it is written? 
The son of man, Jesus, when he came, also was tempted with the same temptations. But he said, I'm sorry, it is written. Second time, it is written. Third time, it is also written. Are we able to stand up and say, I did this last week because it aligns with God's word? I did last month this decision I took because it aligns with God's word. Are we able to say, because it is right according to God's word? Are we able to say? That's the key. The problem is it's not the word that is dictating. What is dictating? It's our feelings, our emotions, our understanding, our will. All this is dictating our decisions. But scripture says when Eliezer was praying for a girl and the girl who came out had known no man. She was not dictated by the world. And she came out where? To the well. Last week we looked at the well, the fountains of salvation from where you draw water. We are not looking at any of that today. And there she came. And now you are going to get the test for the prospective bride. A simple test. Let's go to the next verse. And the servant ran to meet her. When you are humble in your spirit and your beauty doesn't come from outward things but what inward beauty that it is and you are not polluted by the world, the spirit of God will run towards you. What the scripture says in the book of James, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. He's not a God who wants to stand far off. He's a God who wants to run to you. And if he's not running to you and to me, it's a reason because we have been polluted by the world. Because he doesn't see any beauty in us to draw near to us. It says he ran towards her. And what did he say? He says, let me, I pray thee, bring the water of thy pitcher. The test has begun. What would most people have done? You want water? Here is the bucket, here is the rope, you draw. And please, if you break, you have to replace the rope. Honestly, think about it. Whenever God speaks to us, or God speaks to us through others to do certain things, how do we respond? Today, Vijay was teaching about authority. God has put different kinds of authorities over our lives. When they ask something from us, what is our response? How do we respond? Here it's a simple test God is saying, this is how I choose my bride for my son. Elisa comes and says, I need a little water. I need a little water. And the test begins. What did she say? Drink my Lord. Drink. Do we meet the need of the Father? Do we need the need of God first? Do we worship Him? Did you worship Him this morning? Before coming to church for the worship service? What's your first thought about Him? What's our first thought about Him? Lord, you also have needs. God has a need. Do you know that God has needs? He looks for our praise, our worship. He looks whether we are walking by faith. Because without faith it is impossible to please God. You can please God. Did we come? Did we worship? Did we, did we meet the need of God? Remember last week I said about the sons of Zadok? Why does he give the instruction to one set of priests left faithful in Israel? You come and worship me first and then you go minister to the people. What do you need to do? Two jobs. One, worship me, then go minister. First minister unto me, then minister unto the people. Sometimes we get so busy ministering unto people, we forget there is a God who is waiting for us to minister unto him first. And then, look at her response, the bride is being chosen. Drink my Lord, and she hissed, and let down her pitcher upon her hand, and gave him a drink. Who is drinking now? Eliezer is drink, drinking. Who represents Eliezer? Who does Eliezer represent? When we let down our pitcher, do we soothe or grieve the Holy Spirit? We looked at it last week. When our pitcher is let down, whom do we? Do we refresh the Spirit of God who needs refreshing? Or do we grieve Him? You don't have to give the answers. And when she had done giving Him drink, she said, 
I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. Somebody estimated it would have taken her two hours at least to draw water for all the camels. Look, the camels can drink. Now this is the key. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Verse 20. And then verses 5. Matthew 5, 20. For I say unto you, what? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes, the Pharisees. Does our righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees? That? You know what it means to exceed the righteousness of Pharisees? He'll explain it in verse 38 onwards. Yeah. Yeah, 3 8. If somebody gives you on your right cheek, punch him back on his nose. Did you say that? Yeah. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him thee. Other also. If any man will sue thee at the Lord, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall come with thee to go a mile, go with him too. You didn't get it. He's going the extra mile. What did Eliezer ask Rebecca? Give me. What did she say? I'll water your camels also. Are you people, are we people who do only the bare minimum that is required under the law? That's why he said the Pharisees were perfect when it came to the law. But your righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees. Under the law of the Romans, under which the Hebrews were living in Israel at the time of Jesus, if I'm a Roman centurion and this is the mile marker and I find Gokul who is a Hebrew and says, you carry my back. He has to carry my back according to the law. Where? For one mile. Then minute he sees the second mile marker, he leaves it and he can walk away because he's not required anymore under the mile to carry it any further. But Gokul, if he's not operating under the law, but he's operating under grace, he'll walk the extra mile. That's what God is talking about. Are you people of law who are very good at law? Or are you people of grace? Bride will be picked by grace. Grace goes the extra mile. It goes the extra mile. And that's what Rebecca is. Do you go the second mile? Because when you go the first mile, because most of the testimonies are about going the first mile. When you go the first mile, you have only kept the law. Remember, we have only kept the law. There was a young ruler Jesus met one day and he said, have you kept the commandments? He said, yeah, I've kept them all. And Jesus loved him. And he said, you've got a problem. I want you to go the second mile. Sell all that you have and follow me. And he went away very, very sad. Was he perfect according to the law? Yes, but he only kept the law. He didn't go the second mile. Therefore, he couldn't be part of the bride. We are very good till the first mile. And then our smile goes. When you go the second mile, we become the picture of grace. And scripture, God is asking us, do you go the second mile at home? Do you do only what is barely required from your spouse? Bare requirements? Or do you go the extra mile? Do you only go the bare minimum at office? I finished my work. I'm leaving. If you know the colleague on your left and the colleague on your right is struggling and you have the potential and the power in your hands to make it easy for them, but I finished my work, bye bye, I'm leaving. Do you go the extra mile at your workplace? Do you go the extra mile at church? Three places where we operate home, world, church. God is saying, 
You don't realize every day there is a testing that is taking place and a selection that is taking place at these three places. Are you a first mile person or a second mile person? The bride will be chosen from the second mile. We think it's very simple. Jesus is the God of the new covenant. The Father is the God of the first covenant. And Aurelius is coming to choose a bride for the God of the second covenant. The second covenant is about grace. So the bride has to walk in grace. The Holy Spirit is not going to pick the law as the bride for grace. Then we will have, not symphony, we will have cacophony in our homes. You need grace to go along with grace. And there you are. That's what God is saying. Where are you? Where are you today? Are we going the extra mile? And verse 20 of Genesis 24. And she, what does hasted mean in 21st century English? What does it mean? She ran. Why do you think she ran? To finish her work because she had to watch the 7 o'clock program, Kon Banega Karodpati. Is that the reason why she hasted? God is asking, is there any sense of urgency in your lives in serving? A lot of people haste, but it's finished so they can run back to something else. The problem is that when you haste because of that reason, you do the first mile sloppily and they have no time for the second mile at all. Why did she run? Do we run? In doing what God expects of us to do? Is there excitement? Is there a sense of urgency? Do you go the second mile with a smile, with a loving, willing spirit? You need to realize Rebecca had no idea what was taking place there. We have an idea of what is taking place here. Rebecca did not know that a test was taking place. Everyone sitting here knows every day of your life is a test for promotion or demotion. We know God is either choosing or rejecting. Choosing. And He's giving us a fresh chance. Every day He's giving us a fresh chance. That's why He says, My mercies are new each morning. Every day He's giving us a chance. He says, You can be part of the bride. You can be part of the bride. She did not know. She did not know at all what was taking place. But there was this joy in serving. Is there joy in serving? Serving means to give. In the book of Acts, Paul quotes the words of Jesus which is not mentioned in the four Gospels. He says, the Lord said, so we do not know when he said it, whether he told it to Paul privately later in one of his appearances. You know what he said? He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Why? Because the bride will be chosen from the givers. And we are not talking about tithes. You give that way, you run, urgency, excitement, happy, willing. By the time she finished drawing water for the camels, her hands must have been really aching. And that was Rebecca, she was tough. If it had been our 21st century young ladies, after the two buckets, they would have collapsed into the well. <laughs> because they are so strong. That's why our ladies out there in the villages deliver in the fields and go back to work the next week while we have to go through C-section. So they are tough. They are tough material. They are tough material. Every day you hear, Yes, brother, wife delivered. How was it normal? Not no, abnormal delivery, brother. C-section. Why? You remember the book of Exodus when we studied? In the beginning, what does the, the, uh, the Egyptian maid say? They say, no, we can't be there on time because they are very healthy and they deliver before we reach there. The reason? Tough, hard-working women. Check your hands. How are your hands? I'm talking to young ladies sitting over there. If your hands are cracked because you've been washing dishes and swabbing clothes, they are beautiful in God's sight. If your hands are cracked because of soap and the skin has peeled away and your nails don't look so beautiful, they are beautiful in God's sight. Those hands will be held up all eternity one day by God. Men, if you have calluses on your hands, because you don't mind doing the hard work 
it will be found beautiful in God's sight one day. The world will tell something else how to make your hand beautiful. So they will bring a range of products to make your hand look soft and beautiful and make it beautiful. They are not very beautiful in God's sight. Rebecca's hands, if you know what it is to draw water from a well, which I know because we grew up all in Kerala drawing water, you know how your hands will be. That's why we all have these calluses over here because the rope leaves marks. And she's been drawing water all her life. And you know how Rebecca's hands looked. But what if she hadn't drawn water? She would have missed her test because she hadn't prepared her life for this vital moment. And so many people, I tell you, I tell you in the new generation of believers, most of God's people perish not because of lack of knowledge, because of lack of discipline. Because of lack of discipline. We are not disciplining for the higher call to which God is calling us. Paul says in his letter, to that great call to which God caught hold of me. And we are not prepared, we are not ready. What is going to happen to our homes, to our offices, to our churches, if you run the second mile like this? Joyfully do the asked, but also the unasked. You water the camels of your marriage. In every marriage there are lots of camels. Camels are not good looking things. Have you looked at a camel? Have you ever heard anybody look at a camel and say, Wow, what a pretty creature. Meaning there are lots of camels in our lives. Troublesome, painful things, incidents. What about watering them? What about watering? Meaning there are many things which your husband would like, maybe you don't like doing it. Those are the camels. There are many things which your wife would like you to do, but you don't look do, like doing it. But watering the camel costs. It costs. There is pain and labor involved in it. But you do it, why? Because of your heart. How would our homes be if everybody decided to go the second mile? The children... The husband, the wife, how would our offices be if every believer in the office decides, I'm going to go the second mile and I'm going to be excited about it. You know why? Because that's how I am. And how would our churches be if everybody decided to go the second mile and not run while the eyes are closed and benediction is being said? The second mile. Do we do? Did you water? Little do people realize that the second mile determines your destiny. That is why the second mile is the most difficult mile. It's not the first mile that is easy. It's everybody for us to keep the law. Oh, I know I've kept it. Oh, no. Have you lied, brother? No, I don't lie. Have you stolen? No. But have you given? No. Because giving is the second mile. Not stealing is the first mile. The second mile is difficult. Do you hate anybody? No brother. Do you love anybody? No brother. <laughs> That's what Jesus says to the church in Laodicea. Either be cold or hot. Don't be lukewarm. Lukewarm means I don't love anybody, I don't hate anybody. Hot means I'm on fire of God for man and for God. I love people, I love you O oh God. He says let your heart be on fire. That's how the bride is chosen. Little did Rebecca know that this one action would determine the rest of her life. And because of this one action, she was going to be the great, 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 great grandmother of the Messiah. No forewarning, no idea, no knowledge, nothing at all. I'm going to draw water for this man and for his camels and I'm going to be in the Messiah's life. Married to the most eligible bachelor. Please, Shah Rukh Khan and all are not eligible bachelors, okay? People, all these young kids, I'm telling you, you got this ideas all. Oh, they are not ill, they are the most ineligible bachelors. They are not eligible at all. There was only, at that time, there was only one eligible bachelor, that was Isaac. The eligible bachelor. Why? Because of his heart, because of his nature, because of the call over his life. But there he is. And she was going to be the wife of the most eligible bachelor on earth. There you are. Matthew 25 and verse 44. Matthew 25 and verse 44. 
325 and verse 44. And then they shall answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? Verse 45. Verily, verily, he says, I shall say unto you, in as much as you did not to one of the least of this, you did it not to me. Are you getting it? When Rebekah was watering the camels, she was quenching the thirst of Jesus. She didn't realize that. If you give a cup of glass to a prophet, you will receive a prophet. If you give a cup of water to an apostle, you will receive an apostle's reward. If you give a cup of water to a pastor, you will receive a... But if you give a cup of water to the Messiah, you will receive the Messiah's reward. That's what she was doing. So please do not let go of opportunities which God brings you your way to serve him. She came to the well with a servant's heart. Therefore she could bend down and draw water for men and camels. But spiritually she did for Jesus. When the Spirit of God comes looking for the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is looking into the hearts, he is not looking into faces, he is looking into hearts to see, do you have a servant's heart? Philippians chapter 2. This is 5 to 7. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind. Philippians 2 verse 15. Let this be my, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We all say, hallelujah Lord, I have that mind, so I'm going to come first in exams. Because all knowledge came from you. That's what it's not just talking about. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And verse 7, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a... Oh, have you ever heard, other than in movies, a servant marry a mistress? Oh, where do you work? I work at Dell. What are you, senior manager? Whom did you marry? My housemaid. Have you ever heard? A servant marries a servant. Whom are we going to marry? A servant. He's got the heart of a servant. So if you don't have the heart of a servant, he is not going to choose you. That's why he said the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve. But the problem is that we have this new theology floating around saying that we are all rulers. One day, not now. One day, not now. We are servants. What are we now? Servants. Made himself of do servants have reputation? Hmm? Do you have reputation? What are you, sister? Oh, I am a buy in that house, M A L L B. Does she say that? She doesn't say that. No reputation. He made himself up. But that's our problem because everybody wants a reputation. Everything we do in life is connected with that. I want a reputation. When I walk on the road, everybody has to turn around and look at my clothes, my eyes. My eyebrows, my earrings, my bangles, my footwear, everybody has to because I need a reputation which I don't have. And when I print my card, all these letters should be there after my name. And when somebody asks, I have to tell my designation. That he made himself up. No reputation. So difficult, it's so difficult because we are running after a reputation. We are running after a reputation. But he who had a reputation, who had an office, who had initials after his name, who had everything, made himself of no reputation. That is what Rebecca is doing, making herself of no reputation. Who are you? So I am the daughter of Bithuel and Milka, the most prominent family in the city. What are you doing? Pouring water for a stranger and his camels. Who is this man? I don't know. I only know that there is a need. He looks thirsty. His people look thirsty. The camels look exhausted. I see a need. I'm going to meet that need because I have the power to meet that need now. Heart of a servant. Do we have the heart of a servant? Verse 21. 
When you have the heart of a servant and you are there to serve God and to serve man, what happens? And the man? Wondering. Even the spirit of God will wonder. Wow. Did you know that God wonders at some people? Look at my man, servant Job. Did he say? Look at my servant Job. Is there anyone like him? Righteous? Wondered. God is wondering. Wow. Look at this man, friend of God, Abraham. Look at this man, David, man after my own heart. Did he wonder? Then God speaks about us. Is there any wondering? Or the wondering is, how could he fall so low? There are two kinds of wondering. The man wondered at her. Does the Spirit of God wonder at our enthusiasm? At our zeal, at our urgency, at our giving heart to serve him and to serve the people to whom he leads us. Ask? I do not know. But Nathaniel? Did Nathaniel see Jesus? No. Jesus saw Nathaniel. You know what Jesus said? To the few disciples who were there. Look at that man. There is no deceit in his heart. What? Jesus was wondering at Nathaniel. And how does Nathaniel follow Jesus? On one statement. Nathaniel who said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The next day Jesus said, I saw you under the tree. And he said, my Lord, my God. That's all it took. Why? There is no deceit. And Jesus wondered, what? Look at that man. There is no deceit in his heart. Clean. Does God wander over us? Or does he wander over us? Ask. And then he does something. And it came to pass, as the camels had done, drinking. As the camels had done, drinking. Meaning, the choosing is not in the middle. The choosing is at the end of your life. At the end of the task. When the task is complete, not say, once you had given one camel, he said, stop, stop, I have seen you, that's enough. No. Once it was all over, what did the man do? He took a golden Earring. Now the problem is, is in all the other translations it will say no three. Except the original manuscripts from which KJV has written will say earring. Everything else says no three. The problem is with A. Because it says A golden earring, they are all wondering how could a man give one earring. But this is symbolic. Half a shekel weight. I have to stop. Now, if God is giving somebody a earring, why should the weight be mentioned? The weight is mentioned, there has to be a reason. Turn with me to Exodus 30. Verses 12 and 13. Exodus 30, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, When you take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When you number them, that there be no plague among them when they number them. Again. And they shall give everyone that passes through them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. And half a shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. For what? For the ransoming of your soul. Half a shekel is the weight prescribed under the law for the ransoming of your soul. What is Elias doing? He is ransoming Rebecca, ransoming of your soul. I'm buying your soul. What does your soul consist of? Your will, your emotions, and your understanding. He says, I'm buying your soul for my master. It's the first thing he does, ransoming of your soul. Why hearing? What is he doing? He's anointing her hearing. Faith comes from? I am telling you, faith will not come from hearing until your ear is anointed. You can listen to the word for centuries and never faith arise if your ear is not anointed and ransomed. That's why the Spirit of God says, if you have ears, let them hear. Why? Your ear has to be anointed. For that, your soul has to be ransomed. Are you willing to give your mind, your soul, your body, your feelings, your emotions onto the altar and say, Lord, here am I, all this belong to you. You will suddenly start hearing because your ears have been anointed. Half a shekel. And what else did he do? Two bracelets for our hands of ten shekels weight of gold. Ten 
it is sign of God's divine order. Two bracelets, what is he saying? I am betrothed, engagement, engaging you to my servant, of master, I said. See, betrothed ceremony that's going on over there. The betrothed ceremony is going on privately between Isaac's servant and Rebecca. There's a private ceremony that will take place when God's Holy Spirit betroths you to the master. It's not marriage. It is espousal, betrothal or engagement. So Paul says, I want to espouse you as a pure, chaste virgin for my Lord Jesus Christ. The betrothal is taking place. Two bracelets. Why two? Because two is the number of witness. And who are the witnesses? The word of God and the spirit of God. It has to be a witness of both. It's not enough. Lord, Lord, I know all this, but does the spirit give you confirmation that what you know is true for you? Has Logos become Rema for you? Logos is the written word of God. Rema is the living word of God. Do you have that witness? If you do not have that witness, and until you have that witness, when you know you are betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will run after other men representing the world. The heart will be divided. Once this has taken place, your heart is no longer divided because you know whom to you belong. Ten shekels of gold. Two bracelets. Something is happening over here. Something is happening over here. Rebecca has no idea. She knows what it means. But she doesn't know who the groom is. She doesn't know who the groom is. Let's go to the next, next line. Turn with me to Hosea chapter 2, 19 to 20. A betrothal takes place. When God betrothes us to himself, what happens? Two verses 19 and 20. And I will betroth thee unto me for? For some time. Then I will divorce you and don't claim alimony. Does he say that? I will betroth to you for? Ever. Yes, how will I betroth you? Now we are not looking at man's engagement. We are looking at God's engagement. We better know how he engage. That's his sermon. He says, I shall engage you to me in what? Righteousness. In? Oh Lord, I wish you hadn't written that. Take a judgment away, Lord. I don't like it. But he says, in judgment. Because there's a lot of things to be straightened out in your life yet. So I will betroth you in righteousness and in judgment. In? But even in my judgment, how? what is there? Loving kindness and? Mercy. And I will betroth thee unto me in? You can be very sure about one thing God says. I am faithful towards you. I am not sure about that to you, Israel. Finally, Israel, God gave a bill of divorce because they were unfaithful. Nobody can break this betrothal ceremony other than we. He never breaks. That's why Timothy says, even when we are unfaithful, he is still faithful because he cannot deny himself. And you know what? When we are betrothed to him, and what happens? We allow the judgment to take place, and we are faithful to him, something happens. You shall know. You shall? Oh, we didn't get it. Because it's a spiritual meaning of a physical act. Adam knew Eve and they had a son. That's how it's written in KJV. Adam knew Eve and they had a son called Cain. What is he talking of? A physical union out of which a child comes. What is God saying here? You shall spiritually know me. You shall be one. You shall be one. Then you shall know me. Then you shall know me. Thou shall know the Lord. That's what he's talking about. It's not about intellectual knowledge. He's not talking about knowing him here. It's not saying you shall know me. Okay. A spiritual union. And that's what Jesus says. Father, my prayer is that as we are one, they also shall be one with us. That's the desire. Why? It's the bride that he's speaking. There we are. The bride that he's speaking. But if you are not faithful, James 4, Verses 4 to 6. In 4, 4 to 6. From whence comes wars. Okay. You adulterers and adulteresses. Because in the bride of Jesus Christ are both men and women. Flesh. And he calls them you adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Oh. And we ask ourselves. Are we in good friendship with the world? Friendship with the world is, whoso therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of 
God. It's a problem. But the problem is here. The previous words, shall we go back? Three. The term that is used is connected with marriage. It's not connected with unmarried people. Unmarried people, when they commit sexual sin, it's called fornication. Married people, when they commit sin, it's called adultery. He says, you be a spouse to my son, betrothed to my son, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that? He doesn't say adultery with the world, he says friendship with the world. Getting it? He's not talking about being one with the world, he's talking about getting too close with the world. Friendship of the world is enmity with God. Understand what? Because if we forget this purpose, we will think, I am saved, forever saved, this is the reason. No, we are not forgetting the purpose. The purpose is, God sent His Son, He came and died. The Spirit of God is preparing a bride for His Son. There you are. And that's what He says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. And all our reasonings, every reasoning when we say, God understands, God understands, God understands, God understands, I'm telling you, God doesn't understand adultery. He doesn't sanction adultery. He doesn't sanction the world being brought into his temple. This, he says, is the temple of the living God. He doesn't allow that to be brought in. That stays out. He says, you are in the world, but not of it. Be please be careful, church. We are on a journey to become the bride. I mean, the bride. Eleven women went to Isaac's house. Only one became the bride. Do you know that? She also, twelve women went. Rebecca, her nursemaid, and ten handmaidens went. If if my memory is right, twelve people went. Only one became the bride. You want to be a handmaiden over there or you want to be the bride? That's what God is saying. There they sat. There they are. And the next question, Eliezer asks, once he has seen the heart, once he has seen her giving nature, once he has seen her beauty, once he knows how much urgency there is in serving, the next thing he asks is, whose daughter are you? Tell me. I pray. Do we know whose daughter we are, or whose son we are, whose child we are? Do we know? Whose child are you? Is your father's name Bethuel? Are you born of Bethuel? Bethuel means servant of God. Do we know? Who is your father? Ah, my father's name is, or do you remember? I know, I know who my father is. My father is from above. The father of my spirit. The father of my soul. I was born on this day, was born again on another day. Because a servant of God came and spoke the word to me. And who is your mother? She doesn't speak her mother's name. She speaks her grandmother's name. Why? Because the grandmother's name is Milka. Milka means queen. Who are you? I am Rebecca, daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milka. Rebecca means when you are born of God and a child of the living God, your heart, your spirit is bound to Isaac. That's what Rebecca means. Tying bound. Unbreakable bond. That's what she is. Whose daughter are you? Are we bound to Jesus? Are we bound to Jesus? And what does he say? Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? Is there room in your life for the Holy Spirit to lodge in? He wants to lodge. He wants to live, stay in your house. Is there room in your heart for the Holy Spirit? Spirit of God is asking, is there room? Jesus tells the church in Lavadish, the last day's church, our church, he says, I stand at the door and knock. Is there room? The room is asking, is there room? And what does she say? Verse 25, she said, moreover unto him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. Sir, not only do I have room for you, I have room and provision for your camels also. Have we made only room for God in our life? And we have no room for those who serve Him? We have no room for them? We don't have room for man, only room for God? Because so many Christians are only vertically connected, I keep saying. There is no horizontal connection at all. Because horizontal connection costs. He says, I have room. 
And what did the man do? The man bent down, bowed, and worshipped the Lord. That's the key. What did Eliezer do? Eliezer? When our God makes something successful in our life, journey, our effort successful, do we worship or do we take credit? What did Eliezer do? Eliezer, worship the Lord. When things go good with us, when things happen, it's okay to come and testify here, this prayer perfect, but if you listen carefully to the testimony, half the credit is to me. The rest is God's. Thank you, Lord, because you know when I was doing this and when I was walking by faith and when I claimed this and when, then this happened. Nothing there, he worship. Nothing about I there, nothing about Elias are there. Few are Lord. And the man bowed his head and worshipped the, the Lord. Do we worship the Lord when things happen? Is it all him and nothing of us? Do you remember John the Baptist? He's pointed. Behold the Lamb of God who will take the sins of the world. And from that day, so many of his disciples started following Jesus. Then some of them came, some Pharisees came and told John, you are the one who started before Jesus. All the crowds came to the wilderness to meet you. So many people were around you. Now there are hardly anybody and all are following Jesus. What did John say? Really? Get bigger loudspeakers next time. We will make more noise and more sound. Put pamphlets everywhere. Say, John the Baptist revival meeting. Did he say that? He didn't say anything. What did he say? He must increase and I must decrease. A man cannot have anything other than what God has given him. Did you get it? This is the key. Elias is not taking any credit. It's all you alone and nothing about me. It's not even 99% you and 1% me, Lord. It's all about you. And then from there onwards, you see. I will not. Ah, that's the key. That's the heart of God's servant. What does he say? I will not. I will not eat. Will you eat? Before you have finished your task. Because eating talks about sitting down, resting and having a good time. Yet there is a task yet to be finished. At the well at Samaria, remember Jesus went to the well to a Samaritan woman, despised woman who had five husbands and now was living with a sixth one. He sent all his disciples to buy food because he knew if the disciples were there, she wouldn't approach him. And they all went. Something happened at the well and she is converted. She is thrilled to bits because somebody has accepted her. Salvation has come into her life. And then the disciples come there and they hear this conversation about food and water and all. And they said, he sent us to buy food. Where does he get food from? And he said, my food is to do the will of the Father. That's what he's talking about. He says, no, I haven't completed the task that was given by my master. I haven't finished the will of my father. How can I eat? There we haven't even started on the will of God. We are busy eating. Yes, busy indulging in the things of the world when the task commissioned individually for each one of us is lying there unfinished. He says, I will not eat. I will not eat. Do we eat? Do we eat? Are we busy resting? Remember the book of Haggai I told you once where God says, you are all busy building your houses. There why my house lies in ruins. My house is lying in ruins. And you are all busy building your marble flooring. I want this on my walls. This is the way I want my bathroom. These are the tiles I will handpick. How is God's house? Lying in ruins. And who is his house? His people. He says, you are living in this Haifanda houses, busy building those houses, while my house is lying in ruins. Can you eat? Elias says, I cannot eat. I will not rest. I will not eat until I have told you why I have come here. God is speaking to us today. Because we are busy eating the food that is set before us by the world. While the word, work entrusted by the Father is lying there unfinished. And we have been taught that this is the will of God for us. I'm sorry, that's the truth. This has been taught to us from pulpit after pulpit. This is the will of God for you. 
To prosper in this life, brother, live in this mansion, claim it and get it, oh brother, live in this, take seven limousines. If you see an unbeliever's four-star car, lay your hands upon it, says, this belongs to the child of the living God. This is what is happening around, claiming. Well, the first two disciples, after the day of Pentecost, when their ministry begins, and there is a man lying over there, expecting some arms, the first words that come out of their mouth is, gold and silver we do not have. But what we have, we give it to you. Get up in the name of Christ Jesus. Yet, entire life, I'm, I'm not talking about the world, leave the world aside. I'm talking about God's people, the entire message coming from pulpit after pulpit, channel after channel, is that the entire purpose is so that we succeed in the world, and then they will believe our God is God. Why should I believe then that my God is God? I believe in Ambani's God. He has succeeded better than anybody else in India. He's building a house which is costing 4,000 crores. Can you imagine how many zeros are there? 4,000 crores. That is the price for that for the house is building. How many stories? 24 stories. Or one story is a helipad. That is what the world calls success. And that's what the church is also teaching is success. I pray in the book of Romans that the Lord will make my journey prosperous, Paul says. And you know what the prosperous include? Shipwreck, beatings, wiper biting his feet, ending up chains in Rome. And he calls it prosperous. Because he says, because of these chains, the gospel has reached even the royal guard, praetorium guard of Caesar. He says, it's prosperous. That is what prosperity is. We don't want to take the gospel because suddenly we get uncomfortable because... But God is preparing a bride. Preparing a bride. And there you are. We are getting ready for communion. There we are. Eliezer worshipped. Eliezer worshipped. Come to verse 53. Because still 53 is all about the story that happened being narrated. Then we will come to communion. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebecca. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. What was the promise given to Abraham? I will bless you and I will make you. If you walk in obedience to God, then the people around you also will share in your blessings. Because Rebecca was obedient, her family, the people around her is also getting blessed. Now you need to remember this. This is scripture. The people in your office need to say that because you came into this office, we are blessed. Because you came into our lives, we are blessed. We are not talking about distributing money. We are talking about spiritual blessings coming into their life. The Gentiles around Abraham said, you are a king among us. The king of that land and his general came to Isaac and said, you are a king among us. Laban said to Jacob, I know your God is God, therefore I am not doing anything to you. Nebuchadnezzar said, from this day onwards, I am proclaiming an edict in this land that Daniel's God is God. You know why? Not because of anything else, because they were true Rebekahs. The bride and the people around them got blessed. You getting the picture? You getting the picture? Come to Verse 54, they did eat and drink, and he and the men that were with him tarried all night. They rose up in the morning, and he said, send me away unto my master. We are coming to the main point. The main point of today's sermon is this. Come next verse. And her brother and her mother said, let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. After that she shall go. Flesh and blood will try to keep you from fulfilling God's purpose in your life. They will make you tarry in this world while your purpose is somewhere else with somebody else, with Christ Jesus. They will say, no, 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 no. Because who are the ones who have power to keep you away? Those who are close to you. Those who have invested in your lives. They said, let the damsel abide with us. At least ten days. After that she shall go. Beware of the voices that keeps you from fulfilling God's purpose in your life. Beware of the voices and the people who will tell you that is okay, it is all right, God understands. Keep you from your real spouse. They will tell you if you do that, there is spice in your life. God says if you do add that spice to your life, you will lose your spouse. Beware of those voices. 
And what does Eliezer say? What does the Holy Spirit say? The Holy Spirit says, Hinder me not. Hinder me not. Seeing the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go with my master. Don't hinder me. The reason I have picked him is that he should be one with Jesus. The reason I have picked him is that he should be one with Jesus. The reason I have picked her is that she should be one with Jesus. Please don't hinder them by saying that. Please tarry, tarry, tarry in this world. Tarry with the things of the world. You have eaten only one night. Ten more nights of merriment we will have. We will have a good time in the world. We will go over there. We will go over there. You know what? They are using now emotional black men. Stay back. Stay back. Using what? The inducements of flesh and blood from fulfilling you to be with your Isaac. And what does he say? Verse 57, 58. And they said, we will call the damsel and inquire of her. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, will thou go with, go with this man? The sum total of the message God is telling to us today is, will you go with that man? That's it all. That's the marriage covenant. Will you go with this man? Forsaking all others, will you go with this man? That's the marriage covenant. That's what God is asking us today. Forsaking all others, will you go with this man? In goodness, sickness and in health. In riches and in poverty. Good times and bad times. Will you enter into a covenant relationship with man? Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Do you say that you will go today with Jesus? That's the reason we come to this table. Why? Because that's the way he bought his wife. Not with a dowry of money. Not a dowry of shekels of gold. He bought a wife with the blood that flowed from his veins. And he's asking us through today, will you go with this man? Will you go with this man? Who is this man? This man is not Isaac. This man is the Holy Spirit. Will you go with the Holy Spirit? Who will take you to your Isaac? Will you go with him? That's why in Romans 8 it says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God shall be called the sons of God, the bride. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you? Are you saying, yes, Lord, my father says this, my mother says this, my wife says this, my children say this, my friends say this, but Lord, ultimately, I obey and I surrender. I know I'm going to lose. Rebecca has no idea where she is going. Rebecca has no idea whether she will ever see her flesh and blood. She doesn't know who the boy is. She doesn't know what his house is like. She doesn't know anything. But she's seen something. What did she see? She saw Eliezer. It's the thing that we forget. She saw Eliezer. Once she has seen Eliezer, she realized, if he is from that household, in charge of that household, I know what the household is like. That is why Jesus told his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until you have received him. Then you will go and be witnesses of Isaac everywhere. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Tarry in Jerusalem, tarry in Jerusalem because the heavenly Eliezer will come and the heavenly Eliezer, you will follow with him and he will bring you to Isaac. Today we are walking with the Holy Spirit. Today we have to walk with the Holy Spirit so that he can lead us to Isaac. The question is, what is the question? Will you go? Will you go? Will you go? Will you go? Flesh and blood will try to stop you. Flesh and blood will tell you to stop you. They will tell you, you can go here. You can chill out, man. It is cool. God understands. God understands. If you watch this program on TV, it's okay, brother. God understands. But you don't realize, even when you're watching that program, you are being tested. Oh, God understands Radio Mirchi, brother. No problem. He understands. Oh, yeah, of course he understands. You don't realize, you get disqualified because that gets in, the word goes out. He understands. But it's not a question of a God who doesn't understand. It's a God who is testing and picking a bride. Young children sitting over here, young boys and girls. Be careful. God is looking for a bride. And you are also looking for a bride or a bridegroom one day. Let it be in accordance to God's word. This. Most of you are carrying images in your minds and your hearts which has been picked up from the TV and from magazines. Not from God's word. You already decided I want my wife to look like this. 
Instead of change, allowing God to change your wife to look like Rebecca, you are trying to change Rebecca to look like a woman on the street. I want her to dress like this so that all the other young men will look at her when I walk, she walks on to my clinging on. So today it's a different day where men tell women how to wear because they want to wear as exposing as possible so that they can get the thrill of all the men looking at your wife. I'm telling you these images you are getting. Women want their husbands to be like that. Men want their wives to be like that. It's got nothing to do with the word of God. And then when things go wrong, after six months of marriage, seven months of marriage, you're wondering what went wrong because you did not tune yourself to this. You did not tune yourself to this. You went by the world. You chose a bride according to the world and when trouble came, the world took her or took him away. Rebecca was barren. Rebecca did not conceive. You know that? Twenty years, Abraham, Isaac prayed. That is a woman according to the word. She did not tell, take my handmaiden. She didn't say. And Abraham did not, uh, Isaac did not say, my father took a handmaiden. What about you? Do you like that idea? He also didn't say. He prayed for twenty years. Why? Because his spouse was godly. Careful. Be careful. Lot of young people over here. Lot of young people over there. God is asking this question. Will you go with Jesus? When you go with Jesus, you go all the way. All of me said today people don't make a marriage covenant. It's only for better, it's only for health and it's only for riches. Because that's the gospel we are hearing, the gospel of prosperity. See, in the gospel of prosperity, the marriage is also a covenant of prosperity. When my husband brings enough money, I will stay with him. Otherwise, I'll find somebody who brings more money. When my husband is sick, I'll leave him and find somebody who is healthy. Or my wife is now looking a little old because she looks like a bag, because she's given me five children. Let me look for a young one who looks slim and beautiful. You know why? Because we, are, we have bought into a lie. We have bought into a lie. But this is a covenant all the way. He says, will you go with this man? What did she say? What did she say? Let me fast and pray. I'll call all my friends and we'll go on a 21 day fast whether I should follow Jesus or not. All the way. God understands brother. Don't be a radical. Don't be a fundamentalist. That's what they call me in most places. Fundamentalist. Don't be a radical brother. But she's radical. She says I will go with him tomorrow. Today I will go. Have you seen Isaac? No. Do you know anything about Isaac? No. Then how will you go? Because I've seen Elias here. Have seen? Have seen whom? Did she leave the next day? Or it is, does 59 say she left? And they sent Rebecca, their sister, her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men, and they blessed her. Did you see that? Come down, you will see how she went. Before that, before that. And they blessed, and they blessed her, yeah, 61. And Rebecca arose, and her damsels, and they rode. Oh. And her handmaidens rode upon the camels. Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13. What are camels doing? The camels is bringing her to her destination. And who is leading? The Holy Spirit is leading. And therefore, and he gave some apostles, these are all the camels, and prophets, and evangelists, and pastors, and teachers, for what? For? Ah, what is it for? Oh, perfecting of the saint. Why? Because it's a perfected saint who will become the bride. This is the camels Rebecca and company is riding. And for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and verse 13, till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a Perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the bride being prepared, carried on the camels. We get the picture? Are we ready? Are we ready for communion? Are we ready to partake? You have to look at this as a precursor to that great feast. This is a feast set by the Father. Father is going to call us all one day. Only on that day we will know who the bride is.
Many are called, and of the few who are chosen, even few will remain faithful.